Hi, everybody. Welcome back to this week's series of lectures where we take a look at time and free will. In today's lecture, we will answer this specific question, does free will exist? And we'll take a look at four arguments against it, and we'll take a look at various arguments for why you might still be able to believe in it. So in the article, one of them that I had you read for today, a uh, biologist, Coyne, presents this kind of common sense way of looking at free will, or a common sense way of in our heads testing whether or not free will might exist. If you were put in the same position twice, the tape of your life could be rewound at the exact same moment when you made a decision, with every circumstance leading up to that moment the same and all the molecules in the universe aligned in the same way, you could have chosen differently. Isn't that kind of what we mean by free will? That this morning, if we were to take you back to that moment when you opened up your closet, you could have chosen the sweater instead of the shirt? Isn't that kind of what we mean by free will? So then a test of free will would be to bring you back to lunchtime. And with all the atoms in the universe and all the circumstances in the universe, the exact same as when you first made your decision, could you have chosen the pizza instead of the salad or vice versa, right? Kind of a common sense way of looking at free will. In that article, he also presents to us the generic argument against it, right? Against free will. P1. Free will is the ability to freely and consciously choose between two or more options, either on the spot or after deliberation. So same definition we looked at last class. P2, human beings cannot freely or consciously choose between options. Therefore, human beings do not have free will. So most of the arguments against free will, and at least the four that we'll take a look at today, are really addressing that second premise, that human beings cannot freely choose. So why? Why is it that people believe we can't freely choose between options? Okay, so this perspective that says we cannot freely choose between options is referred to as hard determinism. So let's take a look. The first argument we'll look at is based upon Einstein's notion of space and time. That time is another dimension uh, that's tied to space. And since another dimension such as space, then as space is all around us, right? We can move to the left and move to the right. Both space, <laughs> both areas of space are there. Time is also all there. The future and the past is also there. It already exists. The future already exists. It's out there. It's set. Okay, which leads to a predictable dilemma for free will. We're going to call this the pre existing future argument, okay? And even if you don't, believe in Einstein, if you believe in fate or destiny, this still applies. So first premise, the future already exists. P2, if the future already exists, then we cannot make a choice other than the one that already exists in the future. Therefore, we have no free will. So here we are, you are going to, let's rewind the tape back to the moment where you choose your lunch. If the future already exists where you chose the pizza, could you really have chosen to eat the salad? Well, if the future's already set, then apparently there was no choice to be made. You were bound to eat the pizza, right? If Einstein's theory of space-time is true and the future's already out there, then what you're about to do tomorrow, what you're about to do the next day, what decisions you have, the following day, those are all already set, which implies that you don't really have a choice in the matter. So tomorrow, you probably don't know what you're going to wear. It feels like you're making a choice out of free will on what to wear when you wake up tomorrow. But if the future was already set, that you're going to wear the, the shorts and the green t-shirt, it doesn't matter what you feel like. You're picking the shorts and the green t-shirt because the future already set. So how would you object to this argument and still believe in free will. Well, one is you can just say Einstein's wrong, I guess, <laughs> even though science has verified this theory, right, of space-time. You can say, maybe I don't believe it exists, just deny physics and deny science. Now, what else could you do here? Think about how the phrasing is for those first two premises. The future already exists. There might be something you could say about the way we're using the word future and already. I'll let you think about that. Here's one way to visualize how this argument works. Think of a movie, right? So 
as you're watching the movie, you don't know what's going to happen. So it feels as if things are just unfolding, right? And if you are a character within the movie, it feels as if they're unfolding in a way based upon your choices. But if the movie is already there, if it's already created, then the characters in the film don't really have a choice because they're just going to follow all the choices that have already been set within the film. Same thing with us. Uh, since the future is already set, it's kind of like the film's already made. And though we're living moment to moment, feeling as if we have choice, freedom of choice, just like the characters in the film, we don't. Okay. Argument number two comes from theological determinism. Now, if you're familiar with the Abrahamic notion of God, you know, Islam, Judaism, Christianity have a notion of God with certain characteristics. A lot of times their God is thought to be all loving, uh, sometimes thought to be all powerful, but oftentimes also thought to be all knowing. What's the problem with free will if God is all knowing? P1, God or some other entity is all knowing. P2, if God is all knowing, then God knows the future. P3, if God knows the future, then you cannot make a choice other than the one God knows you will make. Therefore, you don't have free will. So let's go back to lunch again. You believed you had a choice on what to eat. So you're debating salad, burger, pizza. But if God is all-knowing and knows the future, knows that you were going to eat the pizza, then the moment you chose, you didn't really make a choice, right? Because you were bound to eat the pizza. Because that's what God knows that you were going to do. Because if you chose different than what God knew you were going to do, then God didn't really know. In that case, God is not all-knowing. Can you see how this is a problem for these Abrahamic faiths that have a view of God that's all-knowing? Okay, so what could you say then against this argument? How could you, um, how could you defend free will against this? Well, the obvious thing you could do is say, well, God doesn't exist. But if you're of the Abrahamic faith, it's not so easy to do. You can maybe say that God isn't all-knowing. You can maybe say God doesn't know the future. God knows all that is possible to know, which is just the past and the present. In either case, in all cases, those don't feel so good to people that believe in a traditional view that God is all-knowing. So one thing to ask is, what's the difference between this argument and the previous one? They kind of sound the same, don't they? Okay, here's the difference. In this argument, we see it based upon knowledge, right? It's not based upon the future already existing. It's based upon God knowing what it's going to be. So you don't have to be God either, right? You can just be some all-knowing oracle or some future fortune teller. And if you are a fortune teller that can tell the future, that are, this argument still applies, right? So it's about knowing the future, while the previous argument is about the future already being set. It's the difference between knowing how the movie will be versus the movie already being made. <laughs> Third argument. Third argument is based upon psychology, and this gets kind of tricky. We have been exposed to hints of this with our discussion last class, last class with Dollbox argument, right? So when we say we have free will, we often mean that when we're choosing to do something, we're choosing to do it because we want to, <laughs> right? We're not coerced to do it. Um, it's, it's not that it's bound to be that way. No, we're doing it because we want to do it. So I'm going to pick up my cup, drink my coffee. If I'm claiming to have free will and I freely chose to drink the coffee, why did I do it? Oh, because I want to do it, <laughs> right? I wasn't forced to. Nobody put a gun to my head. Nobody, nobody controlled my arm to put it to my mouth, right? Free will means I chose to do it, which means I wanted to do it, right? Now, the question is, where did that want come from? If you say that want came from you, what does that mean? Doesn't that mean that that want is the result of your genetics and how you grew up, your genetics and your past experience, nature and nurture. Where else would your want 
come from? Right? <laughs> if we take a look at lunch, and you are deciding between the pizza and the salad, and you go, I'm going to get the pizza. Well, why did you want the pizza? Well, you say to yourself, because I wanted the pizza. But there are reasons why you wanted the pizza, right? Laws of cause and effect. There is some cause for you wanting the pizza. It didn't just come in from nowhere, right? You developed it somehow. And the way psychology would explain it is that your want for the pizza is partly genetics and partly experience. Genetically, we're programmed to crave salt and fat and carby foods, right? Because that's what our people needed, to, our ancestors needed to survive. They needed to get salt and fat and carbs. But, but why pizza? I mean, I could have gotten any other thing. Why, why? You grew up in a culture with pizza. <laughs> you grew up with commercials telling you about pizza. You have memories of past experiences where you had good times with pizza, right? All of those play a factor into why you want pizza. I mean, think about it. When you have a desire for pizza, did you choose that desire for pizza? Or did you just like it? Psychologist says, no, no, you didn't choose the desire. You just wanted it. You just, it just, it's just there because of genetics or past experience. And that's true for any decision you make, right? Why did I want to drink the coffee? It must have been for some reason. If we say there's no reason, then is that really free will, that there's no reason why I drink the coffee? No, we say we have free will because we're choosing what we want to do. I'm choosing to drink the coffee because I want to do. Well, why did you want to do it? If we don't have a reason for why you wanted to do it, then that's just randomness. Is that really free will that you randomly wanted it? If you think about where that want comes from, the only places it could have come from are either your genetics or your past experience. <laughs> well, let's say you say to yourself, well, no, I, have, I can choose the, the salad, right? I don't have to use the pizza. See, I went against my wants. I chose the salad. Well, did you really go against your wants there? If you think about it, you chose the salad and you say to yourself, well, I really want the pizza. No, you actually wanted the salad. Otherwise, you wouldn't have gotten the salad. <laughs> now, your bodily cravings may not have been for the salad, but there was a want for the salad. That want could have been influenced by your desire to be healthy, your desire to survive and be fit. But again, where does that come from? Genetics and past experience, right? The desire to survive, the desire to, to be alive, genetics. The fact that you think that can happen through eating a salad, it's through experience. You learn about salads, you learn about food and nutrition, you see commercials with thin people eating salads, you watch movies where healthy people eat salad. I mean, your uncle who's healthy eats salad. There's lots of reasons that you have a desire to eat the salad. And where did that desire come from? There's only two places in psychology. It's either from genetics or past experience. Whew. So, P1. All behaviors we consider to be chosen freely are the, result, are the result of us following a desire. P2, our desires are the result of genetics and past experience. P3, we don't have control over our genetics and past experiences. Therefore, we have no free will. How would you object to this? Let's say you say to yourself, no, I can choose my experience. I can choose to watch dietary movies. I can choose to read dietary books, right? And because I choose those experiences, then I'll desire the want to eat the salad. What would the psychological determinist say here? Yes, but you wanted to read those books for a reason. You wanted to watch those documentaries on nutrition for a reason. And those weren't random. If it was random, that's not really free will, right? Those desires to watch and to learn and to educate, those came from someplace. Genetics, past experience, both of which you had no control over. What if you're like a drug addict, right? And you are, you are addicted to a certain chemical. And then you decide to exercise your free will to stop taking it, to stop using it, to stop drinking the alcohol, to stop you know, ingesting um, uh, a certain uh, pill. Isn't that a sign of free will? 
Well, the psychological determinist would say, yeah, but they wanted to stop for some reason. They wanted to stop and change their lives for some reason. Where did that reason come from? It came from genetics or past experience. They got to the point where they couldn't take it anymore. They were exposed to something that convinced them that um, that stopping their drug uh, addiction is the good thing to do. Um, uh, they were exposed to people that were able to do it and they got motivated. Something through genetics or past experience influenced them to have the desire to stop. So how would you object to this? Fourth argument. We admit that all matter follows laws of cause and effect, right? That everything that happens from the apple that's on the ground to the apple that rolls down the hill, from the apple that's on the tree that falls down, all of those things don't just happen by magic, but are the result of what the circumstances were prior to it. Well, what makes you decide something? Isn't it your brain? Isn't your brain the reason why you choose something? But the brain is also made out of matter, and matter is governed by natural laws of you know, physics. So just as all objects in the material world are deterministic, so is the brain which means so are your thoughts, which means so are your choices, right? Okay, so the idea here then is that because the brain is made out of matter, just like you and the tramp, just like the trampoline, and all choice is determined by the activity of the brain, and the activity of matter is determined by cause and effect chains governed by laws of physics, just like we saw with pool and pool tables in previous examples and previous classes, and that no supernatural force exists you know, right outside of this cause and effect chain, therefore all choice is determined, right? And free will does not exist. To believe in free will is to believe that by thinking about something, you can move matter that there's some supernatural force, that there's an eye or a will outside of the physical system that's, that, that the brain is in that can impose itself on the brain. It's as if you can just sit there and think really hard and then you know, the computer will, will, will do stuff. Like you can make your computer float up in the air by just thinking really hard. Because if you believe in free will, that means you believe by thinking really hard, you can move the matter within your brain. The idea of free will kind of assumes that there is some invisible consciousness that can move your brain to make choices. Because if there isn't some physical, if there isn't some immaterial consciousness and it's just your brain, well, your brain's going to do what the laws of physics will tell it to do, <laughs> right? That's just how the physical world is. So how can you make room for free will here? So again, we see Laplace's demon raise its ugly head if you're a person that wants free will. This materialistic point of view of the universe doesn't seem to allow it to exist. Okay, now within the generic argument that we see in Coyne's article, it's not just about not being free, but it's also about having choices that are conscious. And he, provi he provides this experiment, right? The Lebet experiment that seems to indicate that our choices aren't even conscious. So we should just take a brief second to discuss this because this is a famous experiment. So remember, the famous experiment is that there were these people putting the machines with brain scans and they would tap their fingers, right? Exercising their free will on which finger to tap when. So you believe you're making a choice at any given moment. But the experiment seemed to see that the brain had already decided up to what, six or seven seconds prior to that choice being made? which feels then as if your choices were actually unconscious rather than conscious. Since this experiment came out, at least a, a couple of years ago, we have come to the conclusion that Lebet's experiment was faulty. <laughs> so this was an experiment often used to point out that human beings don't have free will. See, we can predict what everybody's gonna do before they even consciously choose to do it. It has now since been debunked. But does that really help much? Because we still have those four other arguments against free will. So what do we do? 
why still believe in free will? Well, we still have three other philosophies left pertaining to free will that give us a way of possibly still believing in it. Okay, so remember, we have indeterminism still, we have libertarianism still, and we have the various compatibilisms, all of which are philosophies that say, no, human beings have free will. So first, the libertarian point of view. Remember Coin's test. You're brought back to a point where you made a choice. You could have chosen differently. The libertarian says, yes, you could have chosen differently. Okay, well, why? Why do people believe they could have chosen differently? One, because it feels like I do all the time. It feels like I get to choose to drink the coffee or to put it down. Two, I can overcome bodily desires. I'm not a slave to what I feel like doing. I can do something differently. Three, the I is not material. What do you think of these reasons? We've already addressed most of these, right? Just because it feels like you have free will doesn't necessarily mean you do. In fact, in Cohen's article, he points out that we could stimulate your brain to make you feel like you're doing something when in fact, it's the person stimulating your brain that's actually making you do it. How, come, how about the idea that you can overcome bodily desires? Well, we took a look at that with the idea of the pizza and the salad, right? Because you overcame your bodily desire to eat the pizza doesn't necessarily mean you have free will because there was a reason why you chose to eat something else and that reason may not come, have come from you. The I is not material. So for a lot of spiritually inclined people or religious people, there is this inherent belief that you are an immaterial consciousness, that you are an immaterial soul. But if you don't subscribe to that, if you believe everything is material and everything follows, you know, laws of physics and chains of cause and effect, then you're not going to believe that the eye is not material. In which case, it's kind of tough to really believe in libertarianism. Okay, well, what else can we have here? Compatibilism, like we saw with Mill. So when we take a look at Coin's test, the compatibilists say, you could not have chosen differently, but that's okay because that's not the right way of looking at free will. So Coyne is saying free will is the ability to have chosen differently. But for the compatibilist, that doesn't make any sense. If we went back in time, you would have chosen to do what you wanted to do. You wouldn't have chosen to do what you didn't want to do. So yes, you're gonna eat the pizza every single time you take you back to that moment when you decide to eat the pizza. But it's still, an exertion of free will because you're doing what you wanted to do. You were a partial cause for that choice. Yeah, there were other factors that came into play, but as long as you did something because you wanted to, you're free, which is, right? So what are some obvious problems people might have with this? We go back again to psychological determinism, which asks, but are you really free if you're choosing to do something based upon a desire that you had no choice in, this is a philosophical decision that you have to make for yourself. How do you want to look at this? Do you want to say, no, I guess I don't really think that's free. Or do you want to say to yourself, yes, I choose to believe that's what freedom means to do what I want. And then lastly, a passage from William James. Uh, let's take a look at a few excerpts to get a sense for his philosophy. Old fashioned determinism was what we may call hard determinism. It did not shrink from such words as fatality, bondage of the will, necessitation, and the like. Nowadays, we have a soft determinism, which abhors harsh words and repudiating, repudiating fatality, necessity, and even predetermination, says that its real name is freedom. For freedom is only necessity understood and bondage to the highest is identical with true freedom. What's he talking about? Well, he here is pointing at the people like, like Mill, who is a compatibilist, and say, you know, you're, you're like a soft determinist because you still believe in determinism. You believe that the reason you're free is that you know why it's determined. If you are saying, 
you are free because you are bound by your desires to make that choice, regardless of where that desire comes from, you still claim freedom? Hogwash, says James. That's still determinism. So he's kind of thumbing his nose at compatibilists, right? And calling them like a soft determinist. Okay, so what does James really believe then? What is meant by saying that my choice of which way to walk home after the lecture is ambiguous and matter of chance? It means that both Divinity Avenue and Oxford Street are called, but that only one and that one, either one, shall be chosen. So a little context here, right? What you read was from a lecture James gave at, at Oxford, Oxford at Harvard Divinity School. <laughs> and he's telling these people that came to listen to him speak that, you know, he has a choice of which way to walk home after the lecture, right? And he's saying um, what is meant by the choice is that it's a matter of chance what my options are. It means that both the two streets I could choose to go back home with, Divinity or Oxford, they're both there by choice, by chance. Those are the options by chance, but that only one will be chosen by me. So he's giving us a different framework now to think about freedom and free will. Let's continue. Imagine that I first walk through Divinity Avenue. Imagine that then that everything else being the same, I now make a different choice and traverse Oxford Street. You as a passive spectator, look on and see the two alternative universes. One of them with me walking through Divinity Avenue and at the other, the same me walk through Oxford Street. Can you say which is the impossible and accidental one and which the rational and, necess and necessary one? So what is he saying about determinism and choice? And chance, I'm sorry. What's he saying about determinism and chance? He's saying that by chance, we are put in position with various options. So the future, because of chance, is open. It's not determined because there are several options to choose from. And then when I make a choice and I choose this option versus that, I turn it into a reality and then it appears to be determined. Right. So its appearance of being deterministic only occurs after the choice is made. But because it's by chance that I have several options in front of me, well, then the world isn't inherently determined. I could have walked down the street versus that street. Those options are given to me by chance. But then I choose one over the other based upon my psychology, my desire, right, my character. And then I exercise my free will. That in determinism, I defend the free will theory of popular sense based on the judgment of regret represents the, th that world as vulnerable and liable to be injured by certain of its parts if they act wrong. And it represents their acting wrong as a matter of possibility or accident, neither inevitable nor yet to be infallibly warded off. So he's telling us that what he believes is a form of indeterminism, that the future isn't determined, that there's multiple options from moment to moment for us to choose from. So it's indeterminate. And one of the evidence that we have for the belief that we have choices between options is the fact that we can sometimes feel regret and remorse and guilt for our actions. Because if the choices were always determined, why would we ever feel guilty? Why would we, would we feel remorseful? Because that's what we had to do in determinism, based upon James' philosophy here. When we take a look at Coyne's test, James would say, yes, you could have chosen differently. And he, he provides to us a two-stage model of action here. First is that chance, randomness, provides a set of possible futures, a set of possible actions. You open up your closet, there's a set of possible futures, the jacket, the shirt, you know, whatever. And that's provided to us by chance. Two, choice grants consent to one of those futures actualizing, to one of those futures being taken. So chance provides us with the options, and then choice is what 
allows us to bring forth one of those actions. So if you're going to, well, let's use an example for this. In your closet are a bunch of clothes in there, right? Gifts from certain people. The fact that you made a certain amount of money um, at a certain job, right? I mean, the fact that that company negotiated with you or gave you a certain salary, chance. The, fa the, 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 the fact that your aunt gave you that sweater, chance. The fact that they're all lined up in that closet right now, chance. Some of it could have been in the laundry, right? So chance provides us with a set of possible outcomes, set of possible futures. And then when we take a look and we choose, then we make that future a reality. And it's when we take a look at our choices after the fact that we see it as being determined. But the future is not determined because chance exists in reality. So here's the argument. P1, the world is probabilistic. It's not deterministic. In at this point in time, when James comes about, we have Darwin's theory of evolution, which talks about random mutations. We have the double slit experiment, which kind of confirms that, you know, um, particles are, are indeterministic and probabilistic in nature, right? Things like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle are, are known at this point. So P1, the world is probabilistic. P2, our feeling of regret indicates choice existed. P3, indeterminism is morally preferable over determinism. Because if you believe the world is completely deterministic, then there's no point in worrying about ethics. There's no, there's no point in even having hope for the future. Because there's, you, you have no way of controlling it. There's nothing you can do about it. It's fatalistic. And this is something he goes and rails against right in the writing. So being in indeterminism is morally preferable over determinism because indeterminism provides an open future where you can have hope that you can make a change for the better. Therefore, it is rational to believe free will exists. Okay, let's take a look at this. Any objections to this? We'll notice that what we really have is an argument for why it would be rational to believe free will exists but it's not really an argument to prove or support free will existing. You see that nuanced difference, right? Because we can have regrets and feel remorse, but that not mean that we had choice. That doesn't necessarily imply that we had choice just because we feel a certain way, right? P3, indeterminism is morally preferable over determinism, but that doesn't mean it has to to be true, just because we want to have hope, just because we want to feel optimistic, it doesn't make it true that indeterminism is true. So this is just an argument for to support us wanting to believe in free will, but it doesn't necessarily mean it actually exists. Can you see other problems with the argument? If the future has options for us, which are probabilistic, what dictates your choice in which future to choose? If you're a psychological determinist, you would still say that your choice in which future to choose was determined by your genetics and past experience. If you are a uh, believer in an all-knowing God, wouldn't God know which future you would choose? If you are a believer in materialism and the laws of physics and cause and effect, even though there's the list of possible futures is, is given to you by chance. Isn't which choice you make still determined by physical laws of cause and effect that influence your brain to make a certain choice of which future to have? So what do you think? Is there a way for James to address these? So we're going to explore these topics and these arguments a lot. And as we take a look at the film Minority Report that we'll be watching and or that you'll be watching on your own uh, this week. And then when we come back next week, we're going to take a look at the ethical implications of having and not having free will.